Hello everyone. This is one in a series of keynotes uh, that I'm recording. I'd like to thank the Commonwealth of Learning for their help in doing this. Um, and today I'm talking about online learning in the K-12 school system. And I have to say right from the beginning that I'm a little nervous about this because most of my work in the last 30, 40 years has been in the post-secondary system. However, I am a qualified teacher. I did teach in elementary and secondary schools. So um, I think that I have some very strong views on how online learning should be or should not be used in the K-12 system. But please bear in mind that I, I'm not a specialist in that field now. So I'm going to give some definitions uh, of online learning. I'm going to talk about technology and access particularly and uh, what kind of access different uh, technologies provide. Uh, I'm going to talk about teaching skills online, uh, particularly foundational skills uh, such as reading and writing. Then I'm going to be talking about creating an effective online learning environment. Um, then I'll talk about the strengths and weaknesses of online learning in the school system and then what's going to happen probably post-COVID. The terminology is changing rapidly in this field uh, as new technology comes in and new developments occur. At one time we had two solitudes. There was fully online learning, which was distance. Uh, students would do everything online and not come onto a campus. And then there was face-to-face -face teaching where uh, students would be in class. But we're seeing that break down now, that we're seeing online learning getting increasingly used within the classroom. And it can be just as a classroom aid, like a PowerPoint slide with a projector, or um, it can be uh, where you deliberately design some of the activities for face-to-face -face teaching, and then students do other stuff online. And that could be done either in class or at home. So students might uh, do some work at home and then bring it into class. On So there, there's this various term and terminology. And then there's high flex where basically uh, people choose exactly how they do it. They might come into a class. The whole course might be online, but they may come into class as well. But it's, it, it's either the parents or the child's decision as to when to do that. Now, let me start off by saying we know what works in online learning. We've had over 30 years of experience in teaching in online learning. And as a result, many best practices have been identified through research. Um, unfortunately, most teachers and administrators are unaware of best online practices. We found that many things that work in the classroom don't work so well online, but there are other things you can do online that maybe are not so suitable for classrooms. Um, and in my book called Teaching in a Digital Age, I set up nine steps to quality online learning. Uh, best practices, if you like. So I want to try to bring some of those in to what's been happening in the school sector during COVID-19 and after. So before COVID-19 came in, I'm talking here primarily about Canada because Canada has a long history of online and distance learning. Uh, the first online learning in Canada, or first distance learning in Canada, goes back to the 1880s when the Royal Military Police were used to deliver correspondence packages for the Queen's University in Kingston, and they delivered them all over the country. And we've been, going on, been teaching online since 1990, 1991. Now, online learning in the school system has been primarily used for grades 11 and 12, and sometimes 10, mainly 16 to 18-year-olds, and it's worked very well there. Um, the maximum that students would normally take online will be uh, maybe one course out of, a f out of four each year, or 25% uh, of all their courses at a maximum. And it's usually been optional. Students could choose whether to do the courses online or do them face-to-face. -face. When I say choose, sometimes there wasn't much choice. If you're in 
a school, a small uh, high school in, in a rural area, you may not have a good science teacher. So you don't have a lot of choice, but if you can still go to, go to class. Uh, but you may take that science course online. And most of these courses had professional design from a central unit um, or from a unit in the school board where they had instructional designers to help design the courses. And often there were specialist online teachers, te uh, regular teachers who'd been trained to teach online. And most school boards in Canada have a, a single central learning management system that all schools can use, so you don't have to run it out of the school. It's run out of the, the school board. Uh, there has been both collaboration and competition between school boards. In British Columbia at the moment, each school board can decide uh, on the design and the choice of its own online courses. And overall, there's been very good results. Students and parents have liked this. It's given, added a lot more flexibility to the system. So we have all that experience prior to COVID-19. Now, one of the things that's come up, particularly during COVID-19, is technology access. Um, by definition, if it was optional, uh, students who chose to study online would have access to the technology. But when all students move online, things change quite differently. Now, broadband access is high-speed access, which is really required for good quality online learning. And that means you need at least 10 megabits per second to the device. And to the device is important. You may have 10 megabits coming into the home, but if you've got, say, one parent working from home, one teenager streaming video games, and then another student trying to do online work, then you're going to need probably 30 megabits to, into the house. So, so video conferencing and streaming are fine if you have 10 megabits to the device. They'll ha it'll handle that. But anything below that, video conferencing ha has problems handling. And same with PowerPoint slides, incidentally. They take a lot of bandwidth. Um, so the combination of video conferencing or uh, PowerPoint slides um, can put a stress on home uh, in internet systems. But it does mean you can do, with 10 megabits or more, you can do synchronous, same time, same place. And that's often been used for lectures or for uh, the teacher talking to all the students simultaneously as they would in a class. And you can also do video streaming like this actual recording, which is asynchronous. Once you've recorded it, you can download it and play it at any time. And video streaming and, and particularly synchronous Zoom, Zoom got a massive boost from COVID-19 because basically teachers didn't have to do anything or felt they didn't have to do anything differently from what they already did in a face-to-face -face class. So there was little or no redesign of teaching using um, uh, high bandwidth video conferencing. Now narrowband is in the range of two to 10 megabits per second. And at that speed, you can run a learning management system like Moodle or Blackboard. Um, and it's also asynchronous. You can, students can access it anytime in any place. Um, and that's the traditional way in which online learning had been done up until about 2018 when the video streaming uh, and video uh, conferencing technologies got better um, and more bandwidth was available. But if you don't have um, more than 10 megabits per second, you can still do good quality online learning um, uh, using more narrowband distribution. And again, we've, we've had good results when it's been designed for this environment, and I'll talk about that later. The other thing that is a big problem when everybody goes online, or if you want all your schools to have online access, and that is, do you have a suitable network? And the particular challenge is between urban and rural areas. Urban areas usually have pretty... Uh, pretty good high-speed access easily available because the telecom companies are already there. But in rural areas, that internet access often isn't there. 
And in British Columbia here in Canada, for instance, uh, the government set up uh, an, an agency called BCNet that got a system-wide agreement with the telephone companies to provide uh, equal access uh, internet all through the province, irrespective of distance and location, so that you would pay the the school would or, or the the school board would pay the same internet fees uh, in the most rural area as they would in, in 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 the city. They basically agreed a fixed price for the whole system, and that that enabled more equitable access within uh, rural areas. And as well as actually linking up schools. You need an internal school network, a Wi-Fi system as well. So, again, there are some extra costs in doing this. For students who want to use the internet from home, you're very dependent on the telecom companies and what they're willing to put in place. Um, and again, government policies can be very influential here in providing some subsidies to the telecom companies to make sure that they provide equal access in rural areas where it's more expensive for them. Um, you need multiple devices. You need um, probably an iPad and a computer if more than one person needs to use the computer. And then, of course, is equipment and data fees. Um, so if you're buying equipment or you've got to pay extra charges for uh, internet access or for data, then that's another challenge for many parents. So in most countries, even in advanced countries like Canada, at least 25% of homes will not have broadband access. So no video or even PowerPoint for those uh, schools. So if you want equal access to all your schools, you're much better working through a learning management system than you are through video conferencing. And then on top of that, there's another, there'll be some, some other households who may have broadband access, but they can't afford the equipment or the data. And some schools have been issuing uh, during COVID-19 students with iPads, for instance, on a loan system. So you need to make alternative arrangements then if you're going to require students to study online from home. Um, there's going to be a sizable minority. And in a COVID-19 context where you can have some students in school but not all of them, then the priority should for in-school, um, in-person schooling should really go to these um, disadvantaged groups who have more difficulty accessing the internet from home. Let's look at um, what online learning is good for and what it's not so good for. It's very good for content delivery. You can, uh, students can access online di uh, digital materials such as textbooks or uh, books and so on, or you can deliver content through video conferencing into the student's home. Now, content I define as facts, ideas, principles, knowing. But what we often need to teach children is our skills, such as understanding, analyzing, evaluating, applying, doing. Now, they're both necessary in today's society, but content has been the traditional priority. But if we think about foundational skills, like reading and writing and arithmetic, then you want to make sure that if students are having to study from home, that you're teaching in a way that enables them to develop these skills. And as I said, content delivery is easy online. It's delivering of skills that is more challenging. Now, what skills? I've mentioned some. Reading, writing, speaking and listening skills are very important. Um, getting students to listen attentively and getting them to be confident in speaking developing a good vocabulary and things like that. Calculation um, in, 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 in mathematics or problem solving in mathematics. And then a really important 21st century skill that all students need from a pretty young age, and that's knowledge management. How to find, evaluate, organize, apply information. Uh, it's task focused, but it's a skill that um, students need to learn. And that brings you up against all kinds of things like appropriate 
uh, uh, websites and so on and teaching them what's appropriate and what's not. So knowledge management is a critical 21st century skill and we can start teaching our students that very early in life. Then there's a whole set of other skills like um, managing their own learning and responsibility for their own learning. And these are all skills that can be taught and can be taught at home and can be taught online. And then there's lots of other skills and I leave those to you as a teacher to decide what those skills are. But certainly during a pandemic or during an emergency, you want to really focus on those critical skills because if students fall behind on those skills, it's, it can be very hard for them to catch up later. Now we know a lot about teaching skills. We know it's relatively context specific. Um, let's take problem solving. If your problem solving in mathematics is different from problem solving in your personal life, for instance, um, maybe in some ways the approaches are similar, but in others it's, it's different. For, for instance, the content that you need to know to solve the problem will be different. So there's a little bit of carryover, a transfer is the technical term, between different kinds of problem solving. But you really need to embed these skills in specific discipline areas. Secondly, we need learners, we know that learners need lots of practice um, in developing skills. Um, they need small steps initially. They need, very importantly, regular feedback from an expert, somebody who knows how to do this. And of course, in most cases in school, this will be the teacher. Um, and they need to be de developed over a lifetime rather than one course. I'm still improving my reading speed as I get older, for instance. Um, I'm, I'm learning how to skip things, for instance, or what's important and what isn't. So this is not something that you do once and then it lasts you for the rest of your life. Uh, you have to go on improving. So how do you teach those skills? Well, you need different methods for different kinds of skills. You need discussion and social learning so students can test and develop ideas. Uh, a very common one with parents is question and answers. The, the child asks a question, the parent answers it, then they discuss it. The child will ask questions and you want to encourage your, your, your child to do that if you're a parent. And same way for teachers in schools. So discussion and social learning is very important. And problem-based learning is, a, obviously you have to set up the teaching in a way you have to set problems and, and break the problems down into stages to enable students to learn how to solve problems, for instance. There's experiential learning, that's basically students using real life uh, examples to try uh, to, to develop a skill around that. So, you might give uh, students some, something like cooking, where they have to weigh the ingredients and so on. Then you have to do project, then there's project work. Um, project work is a very good way for teaching a whole range of skills like collaboration, uh, communication and so on. I've mentioned knowledge management already. Now I want to point out that all these skills are not dependent on the mode of delivery. We found we can teach all those skills either online or face-to-face. -face. Um, you'll see the example here of online collaborative learning. Now that can be done either with a learning management system where you can put students into small groups to work together, although they're physically separate, they're in the same online discussion group. Then they can post their work to a central online discussion forum and the teacher can either look at the individual groups or let them work on their own and then just see what they post. It's up, that's your choice as a teacher. But you can do that online. You can do it in a learning management system. You can even do it in a, in a Zoom teleconference because there's breakout rooms. In, uh, you can use the breakout room facility in Zooms for doing that. So all these methods for teaching skills can be done online as well as face to face but you have to organize things differently. You can't just do what you did in class and then assume you can do that online. I have these questions for every teacher who's thinking or having to go online in their teaching. What school should I be developing with the students I'm teaching and how? And again, I'm gonna come back to this. 
This has curriculum implications. Is the curriculum that you have for face-to-face -face teaching appropriate for teaching online? It may not be. During a pandemic, you want to focus on the essentials. Um, and I would focus particularly on the foundational skills here to make sure students don't fall behind. On the factual side, they can always catch up later on the content side. Um, and does the curriculum allow students to do things at home um, that, that they would normally do in school? Some things you do in school, they can't do at home. Can you replace those activities with appropriate activities that students can do at home? And the other issue here is if you're using online learning, if you're using digital technology, how can you use that to help them develop in such skills? For instance, can you give them practice? Is there a, a website you can send them to do, send, send them to so they can do uh, exercises or examples online? There are lots of math sites out there now that are free and open with uh, tests and questions that students could go to to work online. In fact, you might even want the students in class to use those sites, but particularly if students are working at home, take advantage of those sites. In terms of quality online learning, you really need to th rethink your curriculum. Is the official curriculum appropriate for online learning? Now, you may not have a lot of choice over that as a teacher, depending on where you work. But I would certainly, if you're an administrator, say, look at your curricula and see if it's appropriate for online learning. You may have to have an alternative or variance in the curriculum that allows for online learning and students studying at home. Focus on the core learning outcomes or skills. Decide what can wait for a year in a pandemic. Work out the best ways to reach these outcomes in a home environment and include lots of off-screen activities for students here. You don't want students on the screen the whole time, 12 hours a day. They need a break from that. So there are lots of things they could do at home that are not linked to actually being on, on the computer. For instance, they could video, if they, let, let's say you, you, you're using uh, cooking as an example and getting students to weigh things and mix things and so on. Uh, maybe they could record what they're doing. They could share using their mobile phone, for instance, um, and then upload that so, to the teacher so the teacher can see what they've done. So design, structure, and activities for homework. Uh, when I say homework, I don't mean homework as extra work on top of a class, but what the work is that they will do at home. And to do that, you have to work out how many hours you want students to be studying per week. Now, this is a big shift in online learning, because in the classroom, you know how many hours they're going to be in the class, because they have to come to class and the, the, the class is a 45 minutes or an hour or whatever. But at home, it's broken up and intermittent. But overall, they should spend no more than the same amount of time they would have spent if they were coming to school. And to do that, it's really important to reduce what I call teacher talk. Um, reduce the lecturing, the talking to students, to allow students time to do their own work at home. It's really the students who have to do the learning, so it's the students who have to do the work. So give them lots of activities to do at home, watching, listening, reading, writing. And if you can, organize it in relatively small chunks so they can get a break. Um, and run around and so on. And obviously, the younger the child, the shorter the chunks of online learning and the more chunks there should be. Get students to do group work online. Provide some kind of uh, social community online with other students. It, obviously, the older the students, the easier that is to do. But even younger students can benefit from having other young children to talk to. Um, so set discussion forums and use social media if possible. Um, discussion forums are usually embedded in learning management systems. They're easy to set up. You just have to give the child an email uh, 
address and so on, and they and give them the uh, get them to log into the learning management system and click on the discussion forum. Give them regular testing and feedback. Um, students need to know how they're doing when they're working at home. Uh, again, not necessarily for assessment here, just get them to share their work with you and give them feedback. But all within a set number of uh, hours per week. Now obviously students will vary in the time they take and some will take do more and some will do less. But have an average in your mind about how much work the students should be doing, recognizing they're probably doing other courses as well. And probably the most important thing as a teacher for your online students is to communicate with them as much as possible. Be present at online every day so they know that you're watching what they're doing and you care about what they're doing. Set clear expectations for students. Students need to know what they have to do every day and when it needs to be done by. So set clear learning goals, activities and deadlines. Get the students to do the work. Um, this is one way you, you're going to have to spend a lot more time communicating with students online. So you have to reduce your own work in delivering content. The content is normally out there. The students can find the content if you set it up right. You don't, you, so use that time instead for communicating with the students. And try to get back at least within two days at the, at the maximum. If possible, get back as soon as possible. But obviously you have a life as well, so you can't re reply to everything immediately. But the quicker the better with feedback. So an overall monitor the students' activities. Simply track what they do. Um, if you give them an exercise and it's online, you can see whether they're doing it or whether they've done it. So you can check that off for every student. And if you find students are not doing work, get in touch with them. Send them an email and find out why, or phone them. Now I want to talk about the role of parents here. Now, often parents are critical if students are learning at home. And their role is not to teach the course, or not to teach the content, or not even to help them directly develop the skills. But what they should be asked to do is to talk to their children about what they need to do, um, read and listen, see what they're doing, take an interest in what they're doing, and ask questions. And that applies whether you're out to work during the day or not. When you come back, ask them what they've done at school and so on. And structure their times for learning. Make sure the students are getting up in time, they have a set time to do the studying, now, as I said, they should have breaks and so on, but they know that this, this period of time is when they're supposed to study. Use home-based projects where children can find, the teachers should use home-based projects where children find the information, write reports, make videos or podcasts and so on. And parents can help with that, but that's not really their job. It's the child's job to do this. So it's important to prepare a guide for parents. Try to avoid stress with the parents. Make it very clear that this is all you have to do. What you, it's very important, but don't go beyond this. And in, certainly they should not do the child's work. It's the child that has to learn, not the parent. I want to talk about creating an effective online learning environment. If we think about it, a school is a very constructed learning environment. It has walls, it has rooms called classrooms that are divided from one another. Everybody comes to school at roughly the same time. Everybody leaves at roughly the same time. Um, the activities within that room are highly structured. The teacher's in charge, the children sit, sometimes in rows, sometimes not. But that's a learning environment. And I'd point out that this is a 19th century learning environment. It's based on an industrial model of work, where everybody went to work at the same time, they had specific roles and so on. We're not in that age anymore. We do have some manufacturing, but we're in a digital age now. And that means we can create different kinds of learning environments. I want to start off by asking a very fundamental 
epistemological question. What is your view of knowledge and how does learning occur? And I, I'll take two analogies for very different approaches to what knowledge is and how learning occurs. And I come from a coal mining factory. So one view of, of knowledge is, is like, it's like coal. It's there, um, it exists as a certain fixed uh, content, and you dig it out and you deliver it, and the child then absorbs it. This is what I call an objectivist approach to knowledge. Another uh, analogy is knowledge as developmental. Now think of the, the idea of heat, something hot. We, we have a developmental idea of what heat is. It changes over time. If you're a young child and you touch something and burn yourself, that's your understanding of heart. But as you get a bit older, you realize you can put numbers on it so that 30 degrees plus is quite warm, 30 degrees minus is pretty cold. So you're, then you go to school and you learn that there are physical properties of, of heat, chemistry, and so on. So your idea of heat is developmental. And I, that's how I see learning as developmental. So I see teaching as gardening. Um, now, I'm not the right person to talk about gardening. My wife does the gardening. I'm pretty hopeless at it. But nevertheless, what I notice she does, she doesn't make the plants grow. The plants do the growing. They're the, the, the pupils, the students. What she does is create a rich environment with sunlight, water, good soil, and so on, that enables those plants to grow. So I'm talking here now about creating that kind of environment online, as distinct from in the class. So we, you, we can think of alternative learning environments. There's the one we're most familiar with, which is the school classroom, with, with a teacher and students in front of them. There's military training, which is quite different, boot camps and so on. There's team-based learning. And then, of course, there's an online course. And you could probably think of others. Nature is a very good learning environment. Children can learn from nature, for instance. So there are many possible learning environments. There's, the, there's family and life. We learn from that. There's work-based learning. Uh, this is a small company uh, of three engineers and they are learning all the time because they have to do everything. They have to do marketing, they have to do the financial side and so on, although they're trained as engineers. Then we can have online personal learning environments where, it, where the student creates their own learning environment. They go off and find things. And one of the things that happens when you put students online is that you're not in control of that learning environment. The students can choose where to go. They can look something up that you hadn't uh, asked them to and might get a different view on it from the ones that you're giving them. Now, we know from research that all these different learning environments have certain com common elements that will support learning. And if those elements are missing within that environment, learning is less successful. And here's one online learning environment. I put the teacher in the middle. You could have put the student in the middle and the bubbles would be different. But if you start with the blue, Obviously, there's content. Uh, in many cases, the instructor chooses the content, and then around the content are certain activities that are needed for students to acquire the content. Then there's skills, which we've talked about already, and again, activities that are needed to develop the skills. Support for, for the learner, that's the teacher in most cases, but it can be the parent as well. Resources that you've got available. Do you have a learning management system? Does the school board provide you with one? Um, uh, how do you assess your students? That's another e essential element of learning. So students are assessed and get feedback and know what standard they're supposed to reach. 
What are the characteristics of your learners and how well do you understand those and what impact does that have on your teaching? Um, and then the green all around everything is the culture and I want to say a bit more about the culture. Now this is what I believe a rich learning environment should have and you can create that online just as well as you can create it face to face. Um, but I want to talk about culture because I think that's particularly important. What do I mean by culture? It's, it's the feeling or atmosphere that there is in that learning environment. How do students feel in this learning environment? Are they comfortable? Are they aggressive? Uh, what are the values that you expect to be demonstrated in this? Now, I think one of the most important uh, challenges for a teacher is to create a good suitable culture of learning within the, the, the learning environment and again it's your choice as to what these values should be but here are mine uh, inclusiveness I want all students to be able to participate equally I don't want to give more attention to the brightest child or more attention necessary to the uh, the child that's struggling the most. I want them all to feel that they're being treated equally within that learning environment. Do I want them to collaborate or compete with each other? I tend to go for collaboration, but sometimes mix a bit of competition in, but in a fun way where they feel that they're competing with each other, but it's fun, it's not serious. Whereas for, the, for, the, for most of the learning, I want them to collaborate. Respect for each other. This is really important in online learning. People, students can vent, they can be nasty to one another. The great thing about online learning, you can see that. When that happens in a school environment, it's often off, off, the, off the register. It, it's in the corners of the playground and so on. Uh, it's harder to hide yourself in an online environment, especially if they're inside a learning management system. So respect for each other and getting them to communicate in ways that are respectful is really important for me. Make learning enjoyable so that there's games, humour, rewards, intrinsic interest in going online. You try to do that in class, you have to do the same online. You may do it differently online, but it's really important to make that learning a fun experience. So it's important online and face-to-face, -face, but it needs to be a deliberate strategy to create a good culture for learning. Now, you can create a good learning environment, and I'm saying that it's really necessary, but it's not sufficient. On top of that, you still need good course design. You need empathy for your students. Uh, you need competence. You need to know your subject. Uh, and you need imagination to create a good context, a good learning environment. But remember, you want an environment where the learners have to do the learning. And the environment should be such that it creates the conditions for success. Now I want to go into something that's very controversial here. I've been very upset by the way many school boards and ministries have handled online learning. Now let me first say that there are no good solutions during the pandemic. Uh, you really want children in school. It's really important for children to be in school. But if they can't come to school for health reasons, then we need to use online learning well. So the first thing is, what I've seen is often decisions have been made about, for instance, organizing class sizes and what will be done online without online experts participating in those dis discussions. So every ministry should, should be cool. They should have a chief officer online learning. Someone with knowledge and experience of online learning who sits in when major decisions are being made about online learning and who should come to school and who shouldn't. We need a new skills-focused, age-based online curriculum. What is the best things that are done online for which age groups? You can do much more online for 16 to 18-year-olds than you can for 5 to 6-year-olds. But that doesn't mean to say you can't do anything for 5 to 6-year-olds. So. 
Um, but it needs rethinking the curriculum. What are the home-based learner activities that should be done? Does the curriculum provide for home-based learner activities for online students? How many teachers should be trained to teach online? Well, I would say that in a normal state without a pandemic, you should have up to a third of your teachers trained to teach online. So that when you do go to online learning, you can separate the two. What, you, what I don't like doing is having some students in class and the same teacher teaching students at home. We know that doesn't work. We've, we've had lots of experience of that. The students at home feel resentful and don't feel included in the class. The students in class, by being there, take more, demand more attention from the teacher. So if you're going to have online teaching, have a specialist teacher teaching online. It will be a different one from their classroom teacher. Unless you're going to do blended learning deliberately. In other words, the same teacher prepares work in class for students to do in class, and then they go home and do more work online. That's a different model. Every school board should have a standard platform, at least a learning management system, a common learning management system that all teachers are trained to use, whether they're in school or teaching online, because they can use the learning management system in class as well. And if you're going to have video streaming, make sure it's the same network so that teachers and students aren't confused. So one teacher using one kind of tool and uh, another teacher using a different kind of tool. And make sure you have a good network, um, underlying network that allows students and teachers to, re to, to get online. Provide parent guides about what, their ex what the expectations are of what parents should be doing and not doing. And particularly have a continuous assessment strategy for online so that students can be assessed gradually and not at the end where you have to have intrusive uh, things like um, proctoring uh, where students have a camera and have to do tests online. You want to avoid that if possible by having assessment continuously because you can track online learning as it goes. So the teacher can assess how well the student's doing during the course. And that's a much better way of assessing students than a one-off test at the, ex at the end. Here are some of the strengths of online learning. It's good when properly designed for transmission of content, for soft skills development, reading, writing, math, interest in project work, and some social contact. But it is a different kind of contact online than face-to-face. -face. And basically, the younger the child, the more important it is they have that face-to-face -face human contact. Asynchronous communication is good for, and it's good for online collaborative learning. But it has its limitations. It's not for all students. No problems with 16 to 18-year-olds if done properly. And it's a good discipline for them. It, uh, particularly if you have strict deadlines and they're enforced. It gets students at that age to take more responsibility for their learning. Eight to 15 year olds, it's good for specific purposes, such lot, any work that can be done at home and certain areas of skills development, like reading and writing. Below seven to eight, it can't really replace the need for social learning outside the family. And this is a real challenge with something like uh, a pandemic. And parental support is critical, not to do the learning for or teaching, but to provide that in learning environment that I talked about, create that environment at home where students can learn, a, a set place to learn, a set time to learn, etc. It's difficult for most practical work, labs, equipment use, studio work. But some alternatives can be done at home, but it needs rethinking how you do that. And it's difficult, as I said, for social development. Sure, it's important for them to learn how to communicate with the other children online, but also there's a lot of uh, social development that needs to take place face to face. And it does rely heavily on parental support. So what next? Well, I don't think online learning is going to go away after the pandemic. 
we're going to see increasing uses of online in class. So we're going to see more blended learning. But we need to think very carefully about what's best done face to face and what's best done online. We have to be careful not to overload students with homework, online homework. Um, and I would like to see most student work done in class online. Then you have some level of supervi supervision of what the students are doing. It's very important though that we develop digital skills for our students. They're living in a digital world. It's not too early to teach them in school about how to use uh, digital tools properly. Uh, but the most important thing is to get the right balance between classroom, what should be done face to face, and online learning, which those things that can be better done or just as well done online. So I wish you good luck during the pandemic and afterwards. Thank you very much. Now, there are some questions to come afterwards. You can get more information from me. Uh, for, you can download my book, which is free, um, at that uh, website. I've got a blog and an email if you have any questions. Here's some things. You may have other questions, but here are some questions for you to think about. 